Sorry, it was not. Now we're good. Yes. All okay. right. Okay. We'll start going. I want to welcome everybody to another episode of Hometown Highlights. Today we have a special guest, somebody uh, that I've known for a long time, Mr. Jerry Blevins. Uh, he's, he's a family man. He's got two boys. He's married to his wife, Whitney. Uh, he's a retired pro baseballer, uh, graduate of Arcadia High School. He was a Dayton Flyer, and he's played with numerous ball clubs around the country. Jerry, how are you today? Good, man. Thanks for having me on. The uh, hometown uh, highlights for real. We come from basically the same hometown, played some high school ball together. So this yeah, is man. this is a nice, nice connection here. Yeah, it's fun. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to talking with you. There's there's a lot of people that know your story. There's a lot of people that don't. And this is this is cool to have you. I appreciate you coming on. All right, man. I'm, I'm excited. Cool. Dom, how are you today? Good, good. Doing well this morning. Yeah, awesome. So a couple icebreaker stuff, Jerry. Are you an iPhone or an Android user? Uh, I am an Android phone and then Apple everything else, which is very complicated. I just like the, the Google Photos app and I like the accessibility, the camera. I, I use a Google Pixel um, as my phone. I'll probably end up switching back just because now that I'm outside of baseball world we have a lot of like um communication through like slack and and group texts yep. and it's kind of like apple makes it really difficult to incorporate anything android on purpose they don't yeah, they don't sure. like you know sending pictures sending videos all that stuff um but i do like my phone it's a good phone i don't use it for anything besides you know social media and and taking pictures and talking to people uh, outside of that, I use everything else, you know, Apple and Mac. Um, but I am a droid guy. People, every time it comes up, they're like, what is this? Uh, you got like green text or blue text? I'm like, "What? don't judge me. Oh, that's great. Uh, are you a morning or a night person, Jerry? I am a night person. Like uh, about 100% do not enjoy getting up in the morning setting up my alarm is like blasphemous to me. If I, if my body doesn't wake up on its own, I'm angry for like 30 minutes. So my wife and kids understand. So now my, my clock, because my boys get up at like seven o'clock every day. And so now I naturally get up at like right. six 30 and I, I still just don't enjoy it. I need like 30 minutes to myself. And then I'm able to, to kind of hang and, and be normal, but going to bed early and, and waking up early are like my two least favorite things on earth. Man, what's, what's it like being a boy dad? Two of them, right? <laughs> two boys. It's great, man. It's their boys are so easy. Girls problems are, are more complicated because they're just like smarter and on a different level. Boys <laughs> are like very physical. They like, all right, that's hot. Okay. Well, I, I understand that you say it's hot. A girl will be like, Oh, that's hot. I won't touch that. Boys will be like, well, I, you say it's hot. So I'm going to touch this just to make sure. Uh, and so they'll get hurt. And then they're like, all right, that's how I learn or don't eat dirt. Why dad? Cause it's not good for you. Okay. And then they'll eat the dirt. They just need to, they're, they're dumb on a different level and girls are complicated and smart on a different level. So it's fun. They're, they're a ton of fun. They're very just chaotic i don't know how it is for other kids with debt like uh boys with or men with with boys but mine are a blast they're they're go 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 and then they pass out at the end of the day because they're so yep. exhausted so i can relate man we did we had flag football last night so corbin played and we were done like 7 15 he like hit his pillow and was done just <laughs> scored four touchdowns and they won he was excited had a great game but yeah the boys man it's like you say, they, if you say something not to do it, they do it every single time. Yeah. yeah even if they don't want to do it, they're just like, I have to do it now. You said, yeah. don't do it. Yeah. I but, see, I uh, how old's Corbin now? Oh man. He's going to be nine in February. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Pretty... You're in a, you're in a completely, I yeah. have three and he'll be two at the end of this month. So like different sets of, of issues, different sets of problems, man. It's so much fun. It's fun though. I mean, are you uh, coaching the flag football team or are you just you know, being dad? I haven't side? yet. I haven't yet. It didn't work out time-wise this year, but I've kind of committed to Ronnie. I don't know if you know Ronnie Oates. Um, 
he's a great dude. He, he was the head coach this year and he's uh, recruiting me to help out next year. So I think I'm actually going to do it. I, I just, for the, for football, for football, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Jacqueline's coaching his basketball team now, uh, which is cool yeah. to watch his mother um, coach him. Uh, but yeah, for now, I'm going to do the football thing. I just, I don't know. He, he loves football more than anything right now. He's the best at it. Uh, he's a good ball basketball player too. So I don't know. We'll see what he wants to do, but his mom doesn't want him to play football. So we're going to have to see how that works man. out. <laughs> uh, I don't, I hope they, they come out with some new innovations by the time my boys, yeah. you know, if they want to play football, because I would have a hard time with it too, especially at yeah. such a young age. Um, you know, their brains are developing. We don't know you know, down the road, the complications, you know, my, my nephew, Jacoby at Arcadia, you know, I think he's, he's a junior high now. I have a hard time watching him. He's awesome. Great quarterback, Mm -hmm. but it's still so difficult. I I think back to watching my mom pace the sidelines at Arcadia Oh yeah, and I'm like, yeah, I get it now because you're just like, Oh, and I'm so, you know, I'm so I, I was, I'm skinny now, but I was tiny in high school. And, you know, you have full grown men with beards and I, you know, I weigh 145 pounds out there just getting crushed. So it's, yeah. it's, it's crazy. We'll, we'll see. Um, I'll let them do what they do, but yeah, for sure. Football, football is a scary, scary concept. Are they, are they pitching yet? <laughs> Not yet. They, they, they don't really do anything, but they do gymnastics. Like my, my, both of my boys just love running around doing like yep. obstacle courses, like American Ninja Warrior style. They'll throw the ball. They'll hit a couple of golf balls. We'll play awesome. catch a little bit, but their their attention span for a sport is not quite there yet. What are their ages right now? Three and almost two. Three and almost two. Yeah. Yeah. That, Be two at all. the end of this month. You're, you're like right at that cusp of where it like, it's all fun. Every stage is fun, but like this next stage you're coming into is so much fun. Like when they start I talking just, and they understand you and I don't know, it's just awesome. Yeah, my, my oldest goes to St. Mike's here in town for preschool, like twice a week for a couple hours. And like the conversations he comes back with are, they blow my mind as a three-year-old, wow. his concepts and and asking like deeper questions. And it's just fun, man, to, to watch their brains work and and to see them kind of understand concepts. And, and when he, my favorite thing is when my three-year-old asks me a question that's like, obviously deeper he's like dad i don't understand this can you explain this to me Uh, that's when you start to like that's when your brain really starts to open up and form and and you start to see the world in a different way Uh, he just he's getting seeing deeper meaning in things it's so fun it's so it's all it's so scary as a parent because you're like i just don't want to mess this little guy up i don't want to ruin his future and you know every you know that butterfly effect where you say something you know in jest or or joking now and then in 15 years he's in therapy going my dad said this once when i was going to bed and (laughs) it it changed my entire course of my life so those are the things that existentially i worry about but i guess all parents do because you 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 just want to make your your kid's life give them the best chance to have have a happy existence so yeah no this is cool i appreciate just listening to you guys talk i'm on even further end of the spectrum my wife and i are expecting our first in january of this coming year um so you know i'll get all those experiences in time but we are expecting a little girl though so i'll be a girl oh you are you 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 found out ryan did yes. you did you find out i did my wife's terrible with secrets so <laughs> <laughs> you wanted to have Good, the bedroom I mean, painted and all the clothes yeah bought. she's a she likes to prepare so Dom, we were. Dom, you'll enjoy it, man. It's fun. Your life's about to get if super complicated, but super simple now. All these mm-hmm. things that you enjoy doing, you won't do anymore. <laughs> like you don't have to worry about that. But you'll you'll your focus and everything, all your wants will be focused on this little girl. And it kind of puts your life into focus. It, it's so cliche to say you won't know until you know. Mm-hmm. Like until you have a kid, you don't get it. But it, it truly is amazing. Uh, you and your wife will have wonderful times. You're about to, I, I'm sure you love your wife and you appreciate her and you're thankful for her. But once you see the the process, you'll be like, oh my gosh, you're a superhero. <laughs> for sure. We are excited for it. It'll be really, it'll, like you said, it'll be a big change, but you know, a good change nonetheless. So let's go, let's get back into you here, Jerry. Let's go back in time. Okay. I want to talk about you and your days are at Arcadia. Obviously, we're going to talk a lot about baseball, you know, here on this podcast, but let's start with other involvement besides baseball. What else were you involved in uh, at your time at Arcadia? 
Um, one of the wonderful things about Arcadia being such a small school is you can do anything. You can be a part of everything. There's no like elimination process. You don't have to try out because they don't have enough kids to, to feel the team if everybody that wants to play can't play. And so I got to do track one year. I was in band from fifth grade on. So I actually got to march for two years in high school, um, concert band, football, baseball, basketball. Uh, it was wonderful. So I got to do a little bit of everything, art. Uh, but, but I guess my biggest you know, extracurriculars outside of school were football, baseball, basketball, and then band. So those are my, my four big ones. Nice. So baseball, then, I guess, when did that start for you? Or how did you know, was that something, uh, you know, siblings had an interest in you got in or tell me, like, I guess, what was your initial draw interest with the sport of baseball? So my brother, Rob Ellis, who's the now the head coach at Arcadia for baseball, he's an assistant, and I think he's the JV coach now for basketball. And he helps out with junior high football. So he's, he's all in on, on coaching at Arcadia now, which is great. Um, but he introduced me to baseball because I'd watch him. My brother was a great athlete, better than I am. I just happen to be really good at one particular aspect of a sport. Um, but he introduced me to baseball and I had a natural ability for it. I could throw the ball. I'm left-handed. I could always like just throw the ball. Um, but what really intrigued me about the sport as we went, as I got older, was how complicated and complex baseball is compared to some of the other sports are a little bit, you know, simple. If you're big or you're fast, you're going to be great at, at football. If you're tall, you can be really good at basketball until you get to a higher level, right? Well, in baseball, it doesn't matter how big you are. You still have to do this really complicated thing of throwing a ball to this area and also hitting that ball. And so, mm. Um, it's really, I, I was natural at it, but it was challenging enough to where I wanted to work at it. And the real key for me was that the, the ways to practice it, I found fun too. And I think that's what really, really got me involved was I enjoyed the practicing part of it, taking ground balls, playing catch, uh, running the bases, taking BP. There's nothing better. There's no better practice in any sport than taking batting practice. It's literally the funnest thing. Um, so that, that's, that's really what, what brought me to the edge. So my brother introduced it to me and I just kind of fell in love with it, uh, in my own way. That's cool. No, that's cool that you said that, that it's funny you say that he was a better overall athlete than you were. It was just the sport of baseball and throwing a ball is obviously what you were, your expertise was in. Um, but also, you know, just cool. You saying that you enjoyed the practice, you enjoyed how complex it was for myself. I grew up a runner, still run a little bit today nothing a whole lot that's complex when it comes to running. <laughs> well, know, I, 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 I agree, but I also disagree. There's, there's some complexities because it ends up being like a mental battle. It's a, sure. you know, pushing through, you find that where your brain, your body's telling you just stop. You need to stop. This is silly. Why are you doing this to yourself? But overcoming those obstacles. And it's something that I, you know, I think I excelled towards the end of my career, basically the whole second half of my baseball career, um, at the, towards the end of my college, it was like the mental aspect of the game became my best asset. And so I think of running is a, a big part of that because everybody stops. Like, I, I don't know what the percent, I'd say 95% of people hit that wall and they're like, that's enough. I'm done. But it's, it's when you find out you can push yourself further and you can handle it. Hmm. And then that wall, that, that borderline keeps going. And so I, it's not complicated, but mentally running is very complicated until you, you learn your, what you're capable of doing. For sure. It's all about pain tolerance and how much you're able to withstand and push through. Uh, but regardless, it still is. There's not all those you know, intricacies. <laughs> it's literally just trying Physically. to run, run faster than the guy that's next to you. That's it. There's, you know, running 12 and a half circles faster than they can run in 12 and a half circles. That's the entire sport. Um, that's, a, that's a lot of circles to run. Not my favorite <laughs> thing to do running. It's never been there. It's never been fun for me. I don't enjoy doing it, but hats off to you. Fair enough. So you said then that obviously baseball is your expertise. Like at what point, you know, whether that was maybe junior high, high school, maybe even college, like at what point did you realize that it clicked and you were like, I'm, really good at baseball like this is not just a casual sport something i'm enjoying to do but i could really take this to another level there that's a that's a kind of a multi-level answer i knew i was really good 
when I was 12, like, you know, cause just playing on the same competition level, you realize that like guys can't hit what I'm doing, but you never think about like, I'm going to go to the big leagues. You always dream about it, but right. I was never, I think those guys that talk about, yeah, I knew I was going to be in the big leagues when I was, you know, three years old. That's amazing to me because I was always kind of aware of just how rare that would be just how far off it is a dream. You can dream that big and you can chase your dream, but the the idea of actually it coming to fruition is almost foolish in a sense and so I never really thought about it there I got to high school and I thought I was really good I was like maybe I can pitch at the next level um and then I got to to Dayton walked on uh, and it wasn't really until going into my junior year and actually midway through my junior year where I really kind of put the mental and physical aspect of the game together where I started to excel where I was like maybe I can I can make this a profession a little a run for a while and that 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 was kind of my junior year of college is is where I I was like all right the scouts started to come around I had some real good success against um uh when scouts were in the stands trying to scout the other guy I was the one that, that out pitched him and they're like, well, wait, who was that other guy? And so that's, mm-hmm. that's kind of when scouts coming around, I was like, well, all right, maybe we can do this, you know, for a little bit longer than just college. So that, that, that's probably a junior year of college. Nice. So what did that look like for you with going to college? So choosing to go to Dayton, you mentioned that you were a walk on there. Um, you know, what other job off or not job, what other school offers did you have at that time? Or, you know, I guess explain a little more. Was it, for the baseball that you were going to date in, or was it for academics and you decided to walk on then at the same time, you know, what was that decision like? Yeah, I got, I got talked to by some schools. Heidelberg had said, Hey, if you come to our school, you can be on the baseball team. I was like, that's fun. You know, I don't really, I want to go to a bigger school, something a little further away. Um, and so I went to, uh, to Dayton strictly for academics. My best friend, Andy Knoll, who's at one of your competitors there, yeah, Andy's still uh, friend, so we're good. At, at Houston Financial there. Yeah, so um, he he and I were roommates, best friends in high school, and we decided to go to Dayton together. We went down for a visit and fell in love with the campus. Um, they're really good academic school. And so we both decided to go, and we roomed together, and we both were like, hey, man, when the baseball tryouts come out, we'll both go out and try out for the team. And so um, – the old old school walk on I I tried out for the team you know after seeing the poster up in the dorm room and walked out on that Saturday and tried out and and I think uh I was the only one to make it on that team unfortunately Andy didn't make it and um the rest is kind of history Mm. how hard were you throwing your junior year when when you put it together Jared at Dayton yeah do you remember yeah yeah like it's the same as I was now like 88 to 91 um you know I would touch 92 93 every once in a while but not not often but it was you know it was in there it was potential I kind of pretty much stayed even in high school I threw 87 to 89 that's what I remember (laughs) <laughs> i had to face yeah, so face big jerry i got hit a few times <laughs> i hit him a few times <laughs> thing was yeah, whipping I, in there for a high school kid that's the difference so that's you know i don't want to jump ahead here i'll let you guys ask your questions but that was the difference for me going into my junior year was i i had a hard time at high school i could get away with it what i did was i just tried to strike everybody out i tried to right. throw the ball as hard as i could and i had that big curveball that carried me through my whole career uh-huh. um, but i didn't know how to throw strikes i just knew how to throw as hard as i could in high school they're going to swing at it i would walk i had back to back games in high school where i had i threw no hitters i had 19 strikeouts and 11 walks i think and then 19 strikeouts and nine walks i threw a no hitter and I gave up two runs. Like I was just really wild, but I knew that I could probably strike out three guys before they string up together enough hits or I walk guys in. And it usually worked out for me. But in college, when I got there, those guys were like, all right, well, we'll just, you know, see this guy throw. Oh, he's got good stuff, but he has no idea where it's going. So they just put the bat on the shoulder and then just didn't swing. And they're like, all right, this guy's going to walk me. And I did, I didn't know how to throw strikes. It took me, it took me a while to, to harness my ability and to turn it into, you know, throwing strikes and, and how to focus in and, 
instead of trying to strike everybody out, that there's more to this game. And so that was when I put it together my junior year that I needed to focus on other things besides throwing as hard as I could. And, you know, that that's where I, I started to excel. Now, was there a coach that pushed you and helped you with that? Or was that all self, like just inside of you that the mental, I mean, obviously the mental is partially you, but was there somebody that was pushing you to get you to that point? Yeah. So um, the, the, the easy answer is Todd Linklater, my pitching coach there. He went on to coach at Ball State. Um, he's, he's doing a bunch of other stuff now. He, he was in a huge influence in my life. The head coach there was Tony Vittorio. Him and I actually didn't get along. He was very um, disciplinarian. We had just different ways. So he would like get on me and try to motivate me negatively, like just call me out, tell me I'm terrible, that kind of things. And I just, it never, yeah, it, never it didn't did. work for me. It didn't work for me. And I, I didn't understand. I wasn't getting any better by getting buried mentally. Um, I would ask, like, once I got to pro ball, it was like a revelation for me because I asked questions. Like, if you want me to do a drill, like, hey, we're going to do this towel drill. I'm going to ask you a question like, hey, what should I be focusing on? That way I can really concentrate on it to what aspect is going to make me better. In college, that was frowned upon. No, Blevins is questioning everything. Let's get on the line and run. And so I, I, I wouldn't learn. I didn't learn anything. I never got better. And my pitching coach, uh, Coach Link, gave me a couple of books. We had some really like talks and um the mental abcs of baseball and how to kind of focus and he just told me to think about what it is that i want to do and and it was like a two-year process of of learning baseball over again on retraining my brain and so i i give you know a ton of credit to coach link and and him being able to to kind of get me out of my own head and and let what was a negative approach and a motivation that didn't work for me he always had my back and, and made me feel wanted and, and made me feel a part of the team anyway hmm. so so interesting yeah that's cool I was thinking the same thing Ryan you know as far as yeah who did you have to you know you've talked about kind of the mental aspect of baseball but obviously it was your pitching coach which really stepped in and helped you know, really define was, your career, but also, you know, just kind of helped you with both sides of the physical and the mental in the game of baseball. Yeah, it was really, it was really difficult for me. Like my, my freshman and sophomore year, like I said, I was really wild and my, my head coach would come up and it, it works for a lot of guys. So here's my favorite coaches and my favorite teachers, the, the most inspirational people in my life can talk about one subject. So I'll give you an example of our old executive director for our players association, our union head, his name was Michael Weiner. He was the smartest guy I've ever met in my whole life. But what was special about him is he was able to talk to me, a college, you know, dropout three years of college before I got drafted. He could talk to me. He could talk to a guy with a double degree from Yale. He could talk to a Dominican kid who signed when he was 16, a high school kid. He could talk to us all about a complicated subject and make us all understand it. He would understand how to speak to individuals. The best coaches I've ever had could talk to me and be like, all right, this kid obviously needs positive reinforcement. He needs to be like, hey, man, I got you. Put his arm around me. And while other guys need to get yelled at and need to be motivated in, in that direction, the best coaches can adapt to that. My head coach didn't understand that that talking down and demeaning and and berating me in front of my teammates just does it didn't help me it didn't and it's not no fault to him but it just didn't work for me like I, I I couldn't process what he was trying to do I needed and my wife will attest to this I can't I can't pick up on the little things my brain just doesn't work if you want something tell me directly I've been called rude before because I'm very direct sometimes and sometimes to a fault I've learned how to harness it later in life um but that's how I want people to talk to me. If you want me to do this specific task, tell me exactly. I'm not going to, I don't, I don't understand nuance on the same level. And so those, those motivational techniques never worked for me. And so what, what I found was I'm able to eliminate that whole thing. I was able to push him out completely and not focus on negativity. My problem was, uh, again, I don't, I don't want to talk too much, but this is the, this is the difference between 
my junior year before that and then everything after, it really can change my life. And it was positive thought. It was when I was out there and I, I would hear my head coach's voice in my head, like saying, you don't walk this guy, don't throw any balls. And so in my head, I'm thinking while I'm pitching, I'm standing there at the glove and I'm like, don't throw a ball, don't throw a ball, don't throw a ball, don't walk this guy. And your brain doesn't understand the difference between positive and negative. It only understands what you're thinking about. And so most, most likely outcome is it's going to have whatever you're thinking about is going to come true. And so it was a simple technique of eliminating what I don't want to do and focusing on what I do want to do. And that became the difference between like, try not to throw a ball here. The difference between me thinking that and thinking, all right, put this ball in the down and away that completely changed everything for me in baseball, but it also changed my life because I was able to focus on things I wanted not things I'm trying to avoid. And so that was really the turning point for me, for my career, for, for my overall happiness. I learned, I learned the difference between what I want and what I'm trying to avoid. And I focus on things that I need or things that I'm trying to do, you know, and it really helped me on being a reliever because every day I play 162 games in 175 days, like there's no downtime and I have to be ready to play every day. Uh, and so if I gave up a game winning home run the night before, I'm going to go to bed angry. The next day I'm going to wake up. I have to focus. I can't change anything about what happened. I can't try to avoid that. What I need to do now is think about what I'm trying to do. And that works on an even pitch to pitch. All right. It's one Oh, now what do I need to do? And so you just think about positive things that you're trying to do steps forward. And it, and it really reshaped my career, my life, everything. And I love preach. <laughs> Man, that was that was good. I, 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 I hope every you know everybody listening, especially these up and comers, these it doesn't even need to be an athlete, just anybody going to be a professional in life can get something out of that. I mean, it's it's pretty awesome, dude. Thank, thanks for sharing thanks, that, honestly. Yeah, no worries. All right. I hope it made sense because I tend to 100%. ramble. No, you did good. You did 100 percent It's <laughs> pretty awesome. So step in, so you're Junior year at Dayton, uh, MLB draft comes up. The Cubs take you. I don't remember the round or anything like that. Just talk, starting in the minor, their, their system and how that, where that led you to, you know, getting into the, into the big show. Yeah, so I got drafted by the Cubs in the 17th round. Um, I was in Columbus getting ready to start my summer ball team, the Columbus All-Americans. I don't even know if they exist still. Um, but I was literally getting ready to leave. And, and back then it wasn't televised. You didn't have it on your phone. I was watching it on my computer and every pick would go by and just having fun. Uh, I was expecting to go like late forties. So I wasn't even expecting to get drafted high enough to actually leave because, you know, Dayton at the time, Dayton's a, like school in general is super expensive, but Dayton was a private Catholic school and it was very expensive and I wasn't on scholarship at all. Um, I had ended up losing my ac academic scholarship because I, I couldn't attend the classes I needed to because as a student athlete, as you know, Ryan, you only have certain times that you can take classes. And for us, like for me, I only had to, I can only do so many classes and I couldn't take the, the requirement to stay. So I was paying and I needed, I needed to be able to pay for school. And so when I got drafted that high, I was like, oh man you know, this might, they might offer me enough money to be able to, to get me to come out. So I actually right. got drafted. They, they offered me enough money to pay for school. So I ended up leaving um, kind of unexpectedly. And I went to, to Boise, Idaho, um, where I started my first year. And they immediately put me into the bullpen for the first time in my whole life. And I guess, you know, if you want to Ask me some questions about there, but that's how my, my pro career started. So as far as the minor leagues, like I'm interested in the process, you know, you mentioned you got drafted and I don't know how long, I assume a couple of years until, you know, you got pulled up to the big leagues. You know, what was that process? Assuming you started at single A, then double A, triple A, and like you're constantly, and I know it's over the course of several years, but you're like moving to different teams. It's within the same organization, but then you potentially get traded to different organizations. Like, how did that work for those couple of years? Like, was it just <laughs> as chaotic as it sounds? <laughs> it is chaotic. So like, it's not like college football where you're ready to go. You go from the 
college to the NFL and you're there, you're, you're competing. Mm -hmm. Baseball is a different type of athleticism. Like we talked about earlier. So it takes some time for develop. Most guys take three, four, five, six years to become at their ability to play at the big league level. And the baseball system is really complicated, but it's not complicated. It's just a lot. So it starts with like rookie ball, a low, a high, a, double a triple a then the big league so there's really like six seven there's even like dominican academies where they have you know like 16 17 18 year old kids in their academy so there's levels you got to climb the ladder before you get to the big leagues um and so i started out in low a uh finished the year i had a really good year i ended up an all-star had like 1.6 era um i go home come back for my first spring training and I go to Peoria, Illinois, which is low A. Uh, I have an okay year. I had a lot of a lot of strikeouts. I had some development. I had like a five ERA. Um, but for the most part, I, I, I thought I did well. Um, then the next year, come back to spring training. And I think I'm going to Daytona, which is the next level up, which is high A. Um, and the Cubs pulled me into the office right before, like the two days before camp broke and we would go. And they say, sat me down and they said, all right, Blev, we don't think you're good enough to get left-handed hitters out in the big leagues throwing over the top. We want you to drop down sidearm. And I didn't have a, a good agent that I could talk to that anybody that I would trust. And I just assumed that these guys know more than I do. And I just trusted that they had my best interests. And so I said, sure, I'll, I'll try it. And so I dropped down you know, submarine, I'm throwing, you know, 89 miles an hour from underneath. I was like, oh, this could be fun. Uh, I throw one time in the bullpen, the next time they come and watch me and I throw one pitch and I'm like, that was pretty good. And it was 88. And then they come up to me and they say, no, 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 no. We want you like 79 miles an hour to 82. We want you below hitting speed from down there. Um, we think you'll be at your best there. And I was like, again, just trusting, you know, people in authority, Instead of thinking about my own career, I look at it as, you know, coach administrators know what they're doing and they think I'm good at this. And so I gave it a shot. Turns out I'm not very good. They sent me to Daytona pretty quickly. I got crushed. I, they sent me all the way back to Boise where two years before I had like a one six ERA and I have like a nine and I'm not doing well. And so about two weeks into just getting destroyed or a month into getting destroyed in Boise, I start, you know, getting ahead. Like I'll get up one, two, Oh, two from underneath. And then I'll throw a fastball over the top to try to strike the guy out. And I would throw 92, 93. And my pitching coach comes up to me in, in Boise and goes, Hey, Blev, what are you doing? I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, you're about to be released. You're about to be done with your professional career. What, why are you not throwing over the top all the time? Because you've got potential. You're left-handed and you're throwing low 90s. Like, what are you doing? I go, well, this is what they told me to do. He goes, this is your career. And then for the first time, that blew my mind. He goes, this is your career. You're about to be done with baseball and it's not on your own terms. Do you want to pitch like they're telling you to pitch or do you want to pitch over the top and give it another shot? And I was like, oh, yeah this is, this is about me, you know, because I, it's always, it's a team sport, but in a business sense, you're like, oh yeah, this is a, my career. And so I started throwing over the top and I didn't give up a hit for like three straight weeks. Oh my I got, I got moved back to double a. So they sent me from low a all the way up to double a's right before, you know, I'd never been there and it had like three weeks left in the season. And it was like a sink or swim because that was about where I should be my age group. And so they're like, all right, this, he's obviously good enough to be successful for two years in short season. Let's send him up with guys because in double a, you get guys going to the big leagues from double a all the time. The Cubs were actually with the team I was with was more, they would send more guys up from double a uh, and triple a was more the like experienced veteran. So I'm in double a with like big league talent for the first time. And I do amazing. I give up one run the whole three weeks I'm there. I'm throwing like 92 to 95 um, and I'm having a blast. And so at the end of that season, they say, hey, look, you don't have a lot of innings. We want to make sure that you get your arm strength up for next year. We think you're, you know, obviously we were wrong about submarine. They didn't say that, 
but they <laughs> but they said they we need it. you to go play yeah they do it <laughs> uh, they need you to go play winter ball so um winter ball is a completely awesome thing there's there's leagues in mexico in venezuela and the dominican where like venezuela and especially the dominican this is like the cream of the crop everybody plays it's their big league teams it's an awesome experience but i didn't have enough success to be invited to play on those teams i got to go to colombia in south america um competition level was was uh, much lower but i had an amazing time i spent three months there i threw a ton um i spent thanksgiving christmas and new year there uh going into the 06 07 year going into the 07 season so i pitched all over the top i gave up one run the whole three months like i just dominated like i just figured it out and i was still throwing hard um came back that year went straight into spring training uh started at high a dominated went right to double a and then from double a i got traded from the cubs to the a's and went double a triple a big league so in one year in 2006 i was almost going to get cut change my arm angle got shelled in high a back to low a or back to short season went back over the top back to double a then high a double a traded double a triple a big leagues like in within eight months nine months hmm. so it was a whirlwind and that's really you know that really became the time where i can be a professional baseball player because you don't make much money my first contract was for 850 dollars a month um and you wow. only get paid while you're playing and so i for six you know five months i made 850 bucks a month and then in the off season i had to have a job and so i i would work concrete um I worked at tarp stop, you know, pulling, putting, you know, grommets in, into this, the tarp and pushing seals. Like you, you, you are not a professional athlete because you can't do anything else. You don't have, you don't make enough money to only be an athlete. And so once I made it to the big leagues, I actually made enough money to where I didn't have to get another job in the off season. I made enough money to be able to provide until I got to spring training. And so that really changed my whole aspect because I could focus on, being a baseball player for the first time. And, and, you know, my career lasted all the way up until the end of this April from, from then. So. Dude, it's crazy. There's a lot of stuff in there. I mean, I know a lot about your past, obviously being an Arcadia guy, but there's a lot in there that I'd never heard before. That's, that's incredible. The tarp stop, the summer jobs, the eight fifty a month, like we always knew it was a grind, but I didn't realize it was that much of a grind, you know, eight fifty a month is you can't even live off that, you know, like it's crazy. Yeah, we, I mean, we're piled in 10 guys to a four bedroom house. I'm sleeping on air mattresses. Hmm. You know, when I got traded, I'm in, I'm in Tennessee. I played for the West Tennessee or the Tennessee Smokies in Sevierville, just outside of Knoxville. And I got traded. I found out um, watching, we had an off day and I found out watching Sports Center. And then my name came across the, the bottom line. I'm like, wait, wait, did I just get traded? <laughs> like, cause the players are the last to know. We never know anything. And so, um, I got traded and I had no idea what to do. So I, I got traded in July of 07 and that suitcase that I had left, I had to leave one that I left with me in Tennessee. I didn't get back until 2011. Oh my gosh. Like I uh, like my stuff. I came back. I had like a PS one in there. Uh, <laughs> I, I had all, <laughs> I had all sorts of stuff. I was like, Oh, that's where that went. You know, you just loot your stuff follows you around all over the country. Um, it was, it was crazy, man. Just a wild ride. It was, it was wonderful and scary and amazing all at the same time, man. It's wild. It's just crazy to me. What? Okay, so you're brought up in the in the big leagues. What is the feeling when you come onto the field the first time for Oakland? Like, what does that feel like to be Jerry Blovins in that moment? Uh, surreal, man. I, I just got goosebumps, like, thinking about it. So did it. I, it's, asking it's, the question. It's, it's a, it, it, like, 
I've gotten a little bit more nostalgic about my career because while you're doing it, you never want to look back because like I said before, you can't focus on what you need to do. I was always appreciative, but that moment getting called up, like I found out, I'll tell you the, how I got called up. So I was in AAA in Sacramento. Sacramento is really close to Oakland. So it's drivable, like hour and a half drive and traffic. It's like three hours, but um, we had just won the AAA championship. Uh, the PCL Pacific Coast League Championship. We're in the uh, Solon Club in the stands celebrating with our stadium ops people uh, for the River Cats, the, the front office, all the people, the, the owners there, Art Savage and his family, um, RIP Art, uh, fantastic man. But we're there, our managers giving uh, a speech, you know, what a run we had. We really had an awesome team. It was so fun. Uh, we dominated and he goes and one more thing Jerry Blevins you're going to the big leagues and I I I cried like it was one of those things I still I still get like a letter or a phone call or an email every once in a while from somebody that was at that celebration when they found out that it like impacted them because they were you know it's it's a it's a dream come true man and it's it's so silly to think about even when you're that close you know, I had guys that were amazing that that never got the call, teammates that deserved it, that either got hurt at a bad time or guys that got called up and never made an appearance and came down. Just so many things have to go right. You know, I, I talk about luck a lot and people say you were lucky. Yeah, I was lucky. But the point of being lucky is that you're prepared to capitalize on when that luck, when that opportunity shows up. To where when you're lucky, it becomes lucky because you're ready to take advantage of it. And so I felt I'm so grateful and, and, and lucky. I worked my ass off to get there, but it, a lot of things fell my way. And so I get up, it's a, a day game. And so I, I go, I make my debut. I'm jogging out onto the field. I hear the, the announcement. I'm kind of looking around at the crowd in, in Oakland. And it's just surreal. You know, I'm facing David Murphy. I have to take a deep breath and just kind of let it go. And I threw my first pitch and it was a strike. And from then I just took a deep breath and I was like, this is baseball. I can play baseball. And so, you know, my heart rate is, you know, still super elevated kind of every time I came onto the field, but it was, it was like a culmination of a million things coming my way. It was like, my mom was there. Um, like, it's just so awesome. I, I'm so appreciative. I love the o- Oakland days for giving me that opportunity uh, to this day. Um, but it's, it's a moment that, that I can still vividly recall uh, right now, you know, four I'm sure. years later. I mean, being a, you know, small town kid and I don't, I don't even know how many years is that from when you started playing ball, you know, it's just, I don't know. It's so cool for a small town kid to, to be able to do that. And, you know, everybody back here was obviously rooting for you and following along the whole way. And it was just so cool. So yeah, kudos to you for, for doing it and getting that to that point. Well, so, thanks, man. Yeah. Awesome. That's one of the things I, I I'm, I've always been appreciative. I remember that September that when I got called up, we came to Cleveland in 07 and Cleveland ended up clinching um, the division series. That was when CC and, and Cliff Lee and, Faustar Carmona, a.k.a. Roberto Hernandez, were there, uh, and they clinched against us. But I, I'll never forget, I'm in the bullpen and, and right field there, and there's, like, a bunch of kids from Arcadia that have my name in paint across their chest. Like, it's – it's I'm so grateful for the the fandom. You know, a lot of, a lot of guys – had some charities and stuff that they were able to do. I wasn't able, I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't good enough to be able to take my focus off the field as much as I would have liked to do more in the community. Um, I always had to think very, my life was very simple during baseball. It's become complicated now. It's pretty simple being retired and I'm grateful to be able to just be a dad and a husband and a son and a brother and really focus on those things. But when I was playing baseball, all my decisions that I made every single day from what I ate to what time I got up to where I went was all to try to make sure I'm being the best baseball player I could be. Is this going to continue my career? And so I wasn't able to think about community service. I did do 
you know, some free, uh, free um, camps and stuff during the, the all-star break. And I did some appearances and stuff. Um, but now that I'm retired, there's, there's going to be a lot more focus on things that I could do in the community because I just have more time and I don't have to focus on my career anymore in that sense. So uh, I'll forever be grateful to the whole area here, the, from, you know, Chris Miller and the guys that followed me in the media and were able to, to keep, you know, people that cared about me here uh, informed to, to the fans that I would see when I came to Detroit and Chicago to all, all the above. I, I, I'm forever grateful to Arcadia, Falstoria, Finley people that, that supported me. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. It was always fun. You know, the few times that I got to chat with you in the ballpark, it's just like you say, it was nostalgic that you were in the, you know, in the bullpen and you were always willing to talk to people that, you know, you grew up with. And, you know, a, a lot of people appreciate that kind of stuff, Jared. Good. Yeah. I mean, it's well, so, it's so neat for me. You always remember who you are, like who, where you come from. I, I never, I, I'm not any, I'm not special because I got to play baseball base playing baseball is special, but it doesn't make me special. I'm not above or below anybody else. I just happen to, to be good at something that people enjoy watching. And I never took it for granted. I always wanted to make sure like every day I would come to the ballpark and I'd get my stuff in. And then when I would have a free moment, maybe during BP while we're shagging batting practice or right before the game on my way in, I would find a kid. And I wanted to make sure that I talked to one kid, like, like one-on-one, -on -one. not just sign an autograph, which I tried to do every day, but I wanted to like have a conversation with a kid to make sure to try to make an impact on that kid. So that kid remembers, I got to talk to a big leaguer that day. It was so fun, you know, because that's what it's all about. Because I remember being, you know, at a game and I think about the impact it would have, I would have had had somebody from the field come over and talk to me like that would have been amazing. And so I tried to do something like that every single day I wore the uniform. Awesome. Let's talk about just a couple. Who was the uh, funnest batter you ever faced? <laughs> the most fun or like, or, the fun, or, or maybe like the, like, Oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm pitching against this guy. <laughs> Is there a so guy those that are that yes 100 percent. so uh, i'll give you so the the best hitter i've ever faced is ichiro and okay. freddie freeman's like knocking on the door like he crushed me in my career got to play with him see how good he was um juan soto bryce harper you know those guys are incredible but the one guy so my favorite player of all time uh is ken griffey jr yeah like by far my favorite player um a tremendous human being like I've got stories about him just being like a kind person also an Ohio guy um I had to had the chance to speak with him but in 2008 I think it was eight uh he was playing with the White Sox and he, they came to Oakland and he steps up to the plate and they call me in to face him and I've I'm standing on the mound I'm warming up and they say now batting King Griffey Jr. And that was the first, excuse, I'm going to cuss. That was the first holy shit moment I had in my whole career. Like I was like, holy shit. Like, whoa, I got kind of overwhelmed. I stepped off the mound and I rubbed the baseball up and I was like, all right, get out of your own head. This is insane. You know, I, I, I stood in there and he's doing like his world famous, oh, yeah. you know, the bat battle yep. and I'm standing there and it's still like, I got chills again. Like it's crazy to think. So I ended up striking him out, which is amazing. Wow. I struck him out to end the inning. So three outs, I jog to the, you know, I, I walk off the field and I get into the dugout and the manager comes over and says, great job. You're done for the day. And that's awesome. And I'm sitting there and my teammates are all, you know, give me knucks or whatever. <laughs> and, and uh, I'm like starting to like get overwhelmed I started to like tear up and I'm like I gotta get out of here and I I did one of the un, I broke one of the unwritten rules of baseball which is you stay there and you watch your teammates hit after you're uh, in the game and then you can go up so you go up to the tunnel and you then you ice your arm do your exercises whatever it takes so I go up and I, I'm like getting ready to, to cry I'm like I'm not crying on tv I'm not crying in front of my teammates so I run upstairs and I'm trying to collect myself and I'm like I have to call my brother and I'm like, he'll, he'll, he'll straighten me out. So I call Rob and I'm like, Rob. And he answers the phone already sobbing. I'm like, you like, and so I this was, just, it was just one of those moments where 
I literally have done, I faced him a thousand, hundred thousand times as a kid because I did it. And whenever I would think about being in the big leagues, that dream, it was always, you know, bottom of the ninth inning with the bases loaded and King Griffey oh, yeah. Jr.'s at bat. And I struck him out every single time. And then it actually like came to fruition. Like I'm facing him and it was just the culmination of like, I, this is so surreal. I did this in my head. You get to face your hero. Like it, it shouldn't have happened. I'm, I'm so thankful, so blessed to have had that moment. Uh, it was surreal. So that was the big, like one of my huge moments in my career that I'll never forget that I'll forever be grateful for. Um, just so crazy that, that he was able to play long enough to have a kid from, you know, Arcadia, Ohio, who idolized him. He was good enough to, to stay in the game long enough to let me, let me face him. Well, I don't think anybody ever had a better swing than that guy. I mean, it was just, it's beautiful. Man. It was a beautiful thing, wasn't it? What's uh, how about your favorite ballpark? Favorite ballpark. Uh, you can see it. You know, the Red Sox just clinched going to the ALCS. My favorite ballpark is Fenway Park, man. It is wonderful. It is a cool. So, you know, being in the a bullpen pitcher, the bullpen is key for me. And they're in right field, like right behind the fence in the open. And the fans are all around you. So there's like a few things that I have to have. It's like a nice bullpen that has a bathroom and a place to stretch to where you don't have to run across the field. And in the oldest ballpark, you know, in the big leagues, you would think that the bathroom's over there or whatever. They did a good job. Uh, and then on top of that, the, the, there's 40,000 people and the, the Fenway is shaped like this. And so you're standing in the middle and there's 40,000 people just singing Sweet Caroline, you know, yelling <laughs> obscenities at you, telling you you're terrible. Uh, and it's just surreal. Like you, I felt like, I felt like a gladiator, you know, and the Coliseum because I can see almost every single face. when I looked around, that was the, that was the one moment in my entire career as a professional where I got soaked up by the moment. That was, that was later in, in 2007, that same September, I, I came into the game in Fenway park and I didn't record an out. I gave up like four or five straight hits, doubles off the wall, and my pitching coach came up to me, Kurt Young at the time afterward, and he put his arm around me, he goes, what happened out there? And I go, to be honest, like, I just was like, I'm facing, you know, Dustin Pedroia, Manny Ramirez, uh, David Ortiz, like it got, it got too big for me. I started thinking about the, the names on the back of the Jersey and where wow. I was all the history in that ballpark. Um, and he goes, Blev, you got to understand that there's no, higher level we're all colleagues here bud he's a michigan guy so he's got a little bit of an upper peninsula kind of you know, accent he's like blev we're all on the same level here you're you're up here don't worry about the names on the back they have to worry about the name on your back and i i i took that to heart and i never never forgot that it doesn't matter even if guys are better than me like ichiro the, you know, Hall of Famer, there's levels. I'm yeah. not going to pretend that I'm, you know, the same level as that guy, but he does have to beat me every time. And, and I never got overwhelmed by who I was facing, where I was, whatever the case may be. I never let it get to me again from that moment on. But Fenway Park is, it's all the, it's all the best of history of baseball. You got the Ted Williams, you know, seat out in right field. that's red and in, in a sea of green. And it's like, 600 feet away that's the home run that he hit you've got the green monster and all the signatures that you can walk through and see inside inside the 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 green monster the clubhouse is so tiny and small and you know you're getting dressed and you're like babe ruth got dressed in this exact spot like it's crazy to think about uh but that's that's my favorite by far is fenway it's incredible well just out of time let's wrap up with one more question um what are you doing now that you're retired? What, what, what's going on in the community? I know you're back home. We'd love to have you here and, and what you're doing, you know, locally, what, what, what are your plans, man? Yeah. So my plans are kind of open. I've been uh, golfing a little bit more, doing some charity. Every time I go out charity scrambles and stuff, I've been hanging out with, you know, all the people that I've neglected over the years for chasing this dream. You know, like I said, I had to focus so hard on being a baseball player that I, couldn't be a good friend, a good son, a good brother, 
you know, bless my wife, Whitney, I couldn't be a great husband. Uh, now that I have kids, you know, my focus is being a good husband, a, a good father, um, mending relationships, being thankful and grateful and being, you know, I got to go to two soccer games on Sunday, two soccer games and a, and a football game to watch my niece cheerlead. Those are the moments that I never got to go to because I'm always gone. And so I'm just doing that. Uh, I have a podcast or a couple of podcasts that I do. Um, one with the Mets, John Boy Media, uh, called Shea Station. I do one, uh, I do some pre and post game work for the, for the Mets on SNY. I've done some radio. I got to do the color uh, commentary for a game this year. I, I'm enjoying it. I like the media side of things. Um, I have some opportunities to, to do some coaching, some mentoring. Uh, I love broadcast. I love doing it like you guys, this, this podcast stuff. I love this because we can have really fun conversations in, a, in an open format. And it's, I, I just enjoy it. Um, but my main focus is being able to, to be at home for these boys and, and let my wife, you know, steer the ship for a while because she, you know, for so long, she gratefully gave up her life. You know, we met in Nashville and she had a career and she was chasing her dreams and she gave up her, her life to come on for the ride of mine. And, and now I'm letting her do her thing. And, uh, you know, I took my son to, to school this morning and made breakfast. Like it's, it's, it's great, man. Yeah, it's, it's cool. Uh, it's got to be cool for you to just, you're not really slowing down per se, but just, I don't know, you're just being that family man and raising kids and being that, a good husband. That's and it. Son, like, so I'm, yeah, able, I'm able to, to, to get out and stop being, you know, it, it takes <laughs> an extreme amount of selfishness to focus on your one goal. Like, like I said, everything I did, I, I couldn't, I missed Andy Noel, my best friend, the guy I went to college with his two daughters, you know, um, the godfather to one of those, like, I couldn't be there at his wedding. You know, that sucks. Yeah, that's hard. That sucks. That's hard. That's a hard pill to swallow as a best friend, but I couldn't do it. I literally couldn't be there. It's during the season. You know, if he was a really good friend, he would have got married in the off season. Yeah. Andy, but... what the heck, man? I know, I know he'll listen to this. <laughs> but what's funny is we got, we got, uh, we got engaged or he got engaged while I was a cub. I actually had permission to go to the wedding for a day and come back. Um, and then I got traded to the A's and they're like, no, man, no, no, man. <laughs> like, no, we have plans for you. So again, I'll be forever grateful to the A's for having a, a plan for me to get to the big leagues. It's obviously better, but you know, those are the moments now that I'm home, I could go to those games. Like I went and watched his two daughter soccer games, cool. my nieces, you know, cheerleading. Like I, I just, I get to focus on the people in my life that helped me and supported me and you know not worry about so much about what's going on with me for a while well cool man it, it's it's cool to hear your story and, and just a snippet of what you've been through and oh uh, wait wait one more thing i just wanted to point out if you see this thing right here this is the i have one hit in my big league career you did four at bat four at bats in 13 seasons uh, this is the bat that i got a knock on this is one of the shining moments facing kickerby junior my debut I had a big save on my wife's birthday in September of uh, 2012. This might be the best of all of them getting the hit because <laughs> it's so unlikely, so hard, hardest thing to do in all of sports. And I actually got a hit. So that's, I yeah, wanted to make that sure. Was a, that was a single, make, right? To right field, right? <laughs> it was a laser to center field to over, center. over the okay. pitcher's I remember head. watching yeah. it. Yeah. RBI, RBI single. RBI that's right. Single. Nice. Who'd you, hit, who'd you hit it off of? Uh, Clayton Kershaw. Yeah, uh, no, to... no, it was uh, Scott <laughs> Kingery. He was actually a position player. We were winning like 20 to four, but it doesn't, I don't, it doesn't, doesn't matter it for me. It still <laughs> is a, a majorly difficult thing. The fact that I even got an at bat is incredible. So for me to, this is, you know, right next to, the bat to made Jackie the Robinson. And I love it. It made it. Yeah. It made, it made the office. So oh, I have the, big. some of my, I'm putting together my office here. I've got some memorabilia and stuff. I was never really like a big autograph collector, but this is my shining. This is my piece right here. I'm glad That's you my, mentioned it. That's awesome. I try to, I try to point it out when, uh, whenever I, whenever I can. Well, cool, man. Well, thank Well, thanks for jumping on. Anything else, Jared? Nah. Yeah. You got something, Dom? 
Um, no, I mean, I just appreciate your time. It's been awesome hearing your story, Jerry. Uh, you know, really appreciate your humility that you had, you know, have had throughout this whole process and it's cool. Um, you know, obviously I wish we had more time for more questions, but want to be respectful of your time, but just, you know, the transition that you are in now, and now you're just transitioning to this next phase of life as a family man on all aspects, you know, as you mentioned, father, husband, son, and just focusing on those relationships uh, that you have around you. So we wish you nothing but the best uh, moving hey, forward. I'll tell you what, if once I get something to talk about, maybe a camp, you know, or something coming up, I'll, I'll, I'll hop back on. We'll have round yeah. two. That'd yeah, cool. let's do that. Yeah. yeah. I'd love to talk about your camps and what you're doing here locally. So it's pretty important to, uh, for uh, a lot of reasons. We'll definitely have something coming up during down the pipeline. Um, you know, just kind of just playing it slow here. I've got, nothing but time on my hands to I'm enjoying, like you said, being a dad and, and chasing these two little rugrats around. So uh, <laughs> thanks for having me on guys. This yep. was great. Appreciate you, man. Thanks, Jerry. Best of luck to you. See ya. Yep. See ya.